Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about cheap fuel systems and low boil systems. And uh, the first part which we are going to present now is fuel systems. It will be followed by uh, the low boil systems shortly. So, uh, what are fuel systems? First, uh, the function of any vehicle, that it be a ship, a car, truck, a plane. The function of a fuel system of a, of a vehicle is to store and supply fuel to the engine. Uh, modern fuel systems have three parts. The fuel transfer system, the fuel oil treatment system, and the fuel injection system. Here on the right you see a picture of a ship bunkering and that's part of the fuel transfer system. What does uh, bunkering mean? So you certainly heard the, the term and or you're familiar with it. It's, it means loading fuel or lube oil in marine terminology simply. And a vessel, a ship has got uh, for the large ocean-going ships like this one, uh, you've got several type of uh, fuels on board that ship. And I'm listing here the typical fuels you would find on board a, a vessel, a typical bunker. Um, you've got the HFO, which is a heavy fuel oil bunker. You have the IFO, intermediate fuel oil, MDO, which is a diesel oil bunker, and you got the MGO. As well now, you know, more and more you are seeing as another bunker, you see, you're seeing um, LNG. Also, well, we can be bunkering oil. It's another bunker. And um, why... Um, why so many fuels on board a, a ship? Well, in the f discussion that is going to uh, to follow, um, we will be looking at the ship operation with all three fuel oil types on board. HFO, MDO, MGO. And typically, uh, again, why, why so, many, so many fuels um, for ocean-going vessels? Those, those ships um, typically switch from uh, heavy fuel oil operations when they are uh, way offshore. And when they get closer to, uh, to a port, that's when they start maneuvering. And... Uh, ships then uh, switch gradually uh, shortly before uh, or on their way to the port before uh, uh, picking up the pilot they would uh, they would switch from heavy oil every fuel oil uh, to light fuel oil and that that is uh, a good reason a part of the uh, the emission issue now is um, that it's also a more reliable uh, um, a fuel that would provide more reliable uh, operation to the engines, which are less likely to fail. There are more components involved in the heavy fuel oil operation, and it's fine to use heavy fuel oil where in, you're in a uh, constant speed, uh, but diesel oil is more indicated during maneuvers. And uh, as I just mentioned now, on top of that, they are... Uh, new environmental concerns and obligations that now legally oblige ships to operate with low sulfur and also low particulate uh, emissions when they arrived in uh, many countries and territorial waters and ports and some of these areas are called ECAs uh, emission control areas uh, a lot of them started in the Baltic Sea um, around Singapore, Australia, and in the U.S. also. So now there are very stringent rules in terms of emissions. 
and it's going to be reinforced by uh, the AMO 2020 rule that I will uh, briefly mention at the end of that uh, presentation. So all that obliges ocean-going ships to carry uh, several types of fuel and uh, allowing them to switch uh, from heavy fuel oil, HFO, to cleaner uh, light fuels, MGO, MBO, when they arrive in emission control areas. Right now, because of all those pressures and um, environmental pressure, there is uh, there are considerable efforts to develop cleaner fuels and exhaust gas treatments like scrubbers. And one of those fuels that is, that is extremely uh, popular now and picking up more and more is LNG. It's not perfect, but it's an improvement compared to uh, the HFO, uh, which is uh, heavily loaded with, with sulfur and uh, all sorts of, uh, of things. Um, well, we'll touch briefly the LNG at the end of this presentation as well, very briefly. Next slide. Um, now, a quick description of the main marine fuel used. Uh, we are talking HFO, MDO, IFO, MGO. What, what are those fuels? Um, uh, here, the concern is not uh, to uh, discuss in depth about the fuels and the various characteristics, but that should be the probably the object of another course. Uh, in the future, but uh, right now the purpose is to have you understand what the differences are uh, between those fuels. And so, starting with the HFO, heavy fuel oil, it's a, a very heavy, heavy fuel. Uh, uh, like I was mentioning here, it's a worst case substance, and um, it's a uh, um, sort of residual fuel, very, very heavy. And I can show that on that, uh, I don't know if you can see, it's a fractioning column in a distillery. Uh, no, in a, in a, yeah, in a refinery, sorry, not distillery. The, uh, so you see that column here, uh, the top are the lightest, the gases, and the bottom is really the, uh, are the residues. You see the bottom here is, is bitumen, bitumen for, for the roads, and the top here is LPG, liquefied petrol gas, like propane, butane, the kind of gases we use at home or for barbecues. And in between, you've got all that going from the top where it's light and going to the bottom where it's heavy, residues. You've got naphtha, and you've got gasoline, gas, you've got kerosene, uh, aviation fuel. You've got diesel oils that are used for ships, but also for trucks and cars. And you've got lubricating oil, where you make uh, lube oils, basically, it's in between diesel and fuel oil. And, um, um, and here, the FO, HFO, which is what we were talking about, energy residues. Um, back on the on the slide, these are the HFOs we are talking about here. HFOs and the uh, MDO is uh, actually marine diesel oil. It's um, made of of various plants of distillates. Um, with uh, some HFO mixed in I into, into it, blended, but very, very low uh, content. Um, and, oh, I forgot to mention, but the HFO needs to be heated during storage because it's so viscous, so heavy. But the MDO doesn't have to be uh, heated during storage. Um, you have uh, another fuel used in the marine industry, which is the H I IFO, Intermediate Fuel Oil, and there is, um, uh, it's a lighter fuel than HFO, but it's, it's heavier than MDO, it has to, it has a higher proportion of HFO in it, it must be heated, and uh, those fuels that must be heated must also be, uh, have their viscosity control uh, prior to being um, 
injected in the in the engines. So and then you have the last one, the MGO marine gas oil. Um, it's a high quality uh, fuel made from diesel only, and it's similar to the the, the, the oil, uh, the, the the diesel oil we are using here for trucks or some cars, uh, for fishing boats, I suppose. But the, it has a higher density, and this one doesn't have to be heated normally, except if they are waxes, because again, um, one of the issues here is that. Um, Qualities vary considerably uh, depending on where you you uh, get your fuel when you bunker. Uh, in some part of the world, well, the refinery process is not very controlled, or they sometimes mix fuels and you uh, or you have residues because the, uh, the the fuels are stored on top of each other in some tanks and settle. So you can have really terrible, terrible quality fuels, hence the importance when you a bunker, when you receive fuel on board your vessel to uh, take samples and have them analyzed uh, so you know what you're doing with and what you're paying for. Um, now, bunkering, well, when, when your ship needs to be refueled, um, the fuel needs to go somewhere on the on the ship and they are very large capacities, uh, of course. Ships sometimes are at sea for weeks in a row, so you need you need a good good storage capacity here. So uh, I'm putting the general arrangement of a fishing vessel, the Alaska Ranger here, to show um, where this um, bunker is stored. Um, and here on that view, you can see there is a. Uh, fuel tank. If I go on that view, you will see the different fuel tanks, fuel oil wing tanks, wing tanks. Uh, you've got fuel oil tanks here, and you've got day tanks. We're going to talk about that in a, uh, in a short while. Uh, so you see, this is a, a fishing vessel, but imagine a large container carrier or uh, an oil tanker. Large vessels, they have a, a considerable number of large, very large uh, tanks. Um, on that slide, I'm showing a picture of the interior of a HA4 heavy fuel oil tank. And you see it's really extremely, extremely dirty. Um, we, um, that, that was, yeah, when we, Dry dock ships every five years. Uh, we generally clean the the tanks because after several years, uh, those tanks get a layer of residues inside, and so it's it's not a, a fun job for those who, who clean those tanks. But it's really part of what of the services that shipyards typically provide. Um, here, yes, you've got, as, as I mentioned, you need to heat up those fuels. So here you've got um, heating coil. And you can see it's like doing this. And uh, because we were talking about bunkering, of course, we need uh, the, a barge like here. Uh, two and hoses to be connected somewhere on the deck. So. Here is, for example, uh, one manifold you can typically find on a, on a ship with a hose. Another one here, and you see there is a drip pan. Uh, there are very drastic rules, extremely drastic rules, to prevent, um, uh, the, uh, uh, to prevent spills. Um, here is uh, a view of... Uh, uh, Someone on watch, you know, ready with his oil spill um, system here, and extinguisher, and walkie talkie, so it's coordinating with the barge and with the, the deck. And so that's fuel, that yellow one is lube oil. And uh, so this is a very serious type of operation. Um, 
Yeah, very quickly here is a uh, how uh, one of those tanks you know we saw here looks like, or what's the uh, typical arrangement is. Um, so that's that's a tank here. Here is the the deck. It's not a very very good drawing, but hopefully it shows what it is about. Uh, and it's it's showing a, a small tank. The uh, anyway, the principle is the same. So you've got uh, a filling line here. And you've got uh, a vent pipe, very important. And you have uh, he's here a shut off valve. We are going to talk about that as well. So it's for emergency. Side glass depends what sort of a. Of a of uh, fuel or tank you are using, but on ships you generally don't have side glass except those. Uh, some of the uh, some of some ships in in, in smaller tanks in uh, engine compartments sometimes, but not for heavy fuel oil anyway. You wouldn't see anything. But the way you know that a very important thing to have on ships as well is a sounding tube here, which I'm um, representing on that image and you see how that works you basically have a sounding pipe and a, a sounding system sort of roll and you measure actually the well you look on your tape uh, where um, you dip it to the bottom and you see where the limit between the dry part and the uh, uh, the part covered of the tape covered with fuel is it's very visible with fuel very easy to to see and you deduct that that value so this is the way sounding is done there are also some systems now um, a little bit everywhere where you build transducers or like a sort of radar but generally people keep on um uh, keep on checking um the actual um uh, the actual volume of, of tanks before after filling them and during the course of the voyage uh, using uh, a sounding system. So back on that, uh, on that drawing, you've got the sludge drain valve over time. Uh, things accumulate in the bottom and you need to be able to drain that. Uh, and then, you know, that, um, that fuel must be able to be to go to the engine room so it starts its, uh, its journey there starting with the uh, going to the sitting tanks um, in that uh, another image here of where the you know those fuel tanks could be it's you know here wing tanks that's badass tanks but the fuel tanks typically would be here. It's for tankers, so there's another uh, volume here for cargo. Air pipe vents. Yeah, well, that's that's a vent here on a on a ship. This is just a principle, but on on a large ship, you know, you have uh, breathable um, uh, air vents. Um, so if you have a wave here, you know, and it's not going to. It's, it's going to to prevent actually water to get inside the tank, um, and uh, and you would just open as needed. This valve is is a floater. That's a the way it used to look. It's a vintage one, um, and here you've got the view of a damaged uh, breathable uh, vent. It's uh, very frequent to find them damaged. They need to be. Um, Maintain very well. Um, okay, here is uh, just uh, quickly the bunkering um, operation. You see, there is before bunkering checks, during bunkering checks, after bunkering checks. So this is these they are procedures, and this is a very serious operation considering the risk of spill and uh, as well the risk of of causing um, uh, fire. So, like, just to give an example, before bunkering, uh, that's the first stage. 
the bunker bar is is moored uh, securely moored to the ship and means of access is rigged and SOPEP equipment is his uh, anti-spill equipment that is already arranged, the treat tray is plugged, communication established, connection checked, um, uh, no smoking sign, but generally you don't smoke there, but it's important to put a non smoking sign, check the sounding in the supplier's tank, which means uh, in the bunker barge first to see what the initial uh, level is and line the ship tax valve to receive bunker oil. And during bunkering, maintain feeling rate, maintain low pumping, collect drip sample, very, very important to have sample for the reasons I explained. You never know what sort of quality you're going to have. Take frequent sounding so you keep on following the how the level evolve. Cautiously charge over tanks. When a tank is full, you need to to uh, open another one. Obviously, this has to be done in coordination with the uh, uh, first officer, chief engineer. Uh, air blow for drainage the bunker hose. Air blow is to 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 yeah blow the hoses. Uh, shut bunker, manifold valve, etc. So that after bunkering checks, calculate the total quality of bunker received on board uh, as per the bunker delivery note. Charge over tax by correctly operating line valve, etc. Clean bunker station, etc. So there is, it's a real procedure. Now, where does it go from there? Um, it's now we bunkered, it's stored in the, in the bunker tank, in the, in the ship, wing tank, or wherever it is. Um, so that, what happens after that? It is sent to uh, another tank, which is a settling tank. And uh, that sitting tank, and I will explain later, but is going to be, uh, well, to prepare the fuel that I explain later. Then from that settling tank, it, it's purified. And you saw uh, that uh, the presentation recently uh, about purification, separation, centrifuge machines. So this is where they are between the sitting tank and the day tank. And this is a day tank here. And after the day tank, it goes to the engines. And there is another tank, which is a sludge tank because the obviously uh, after, uh, uh, after passing through the, 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 the purification phase, uh, the impurities, sludge, are have to go somewhere, so they go to the sludge tank. Um, again, I repeat, you've seen recently uh, Professor Wallace's presentation about uh, about this, so please refer to it. So again, bunker tanks to a settling tank to day tank to engines. Now, settling tanks. What is their function? Very quickly. Um, it's to uh, prepare the use of, of the fuel here. I'm mentioning HFO. In preparation for use, the uh, HFO is transferred to the fuel oil settling tank via FO transfer, transfer pumps, which are equipped with a, a strainer. And the function of those settling tank is this one, is they are used to uh, allow the elimination of gross water and solids uh, and then they so they settle on the bottom here so as you can see on that diagram it's not very clear uh, one important thing here is that you heat that fuel and you let it settle so here is uh, the sludge and 
and the water. The water goes in the bottom. This is fuel, lighter density. Uh, so there is a, as well, <clears throat> a vent, flame track, trap, and uh, overflow, of course. And this is where the, the fuel will leave once treated. Uh, it would go to the centrifuge. Here's a, a picture of a ocean-going ship um, sitting tank. Now the second tanks are, as mentioned, the uh, day tanks here. We just talked about sitting tank, day tanks. Other day tanks, here's a picture of a day tank. Um, they are... Um, they are tanks where the uh, the uh, oil or the fuel is clean and um, and treated, ready to go to the main engines. There will be further steps of uh, of uh, filtering. You will see, but it's really uh, ready to go. So day tanks, so service tanks, the same thing. I'm not sure, but I think the Maybe the military used eight tanks and uh, civilian ships use, or companies use service tanks, but it's the same thing. And they are normally located as part of the bulkhead of the engine room. Here's another view of what there is, the purification process between the settling tank and the service tank. So you've got uh, here area two purifiers and a feed pump to transfer that to the settling tank to the service tank. Um, and again, you have seen that recently, uh, refer to the uh, Previous lecture, this is a view of uh, what you have on the state of Maine. They are also um, purifiers, centrifuge. And um, here's a, a diagram, which is a bit more precise than the, the very simple one I showed earlier, which was this one. It's a bit more elaborate, but not very complicated. We'll go through that together. Uh, quickly. So, just to give you some orientation, we have here the settling tank, and here you have the day tank. So, things need to go up, oh, and here you've got the bunker tanks, and here the sludge tank. So, we start with the bunker tank. So, uh, there is first a strainer here. We go, we're going to the, the settling tank from here to here. Uh, strainer, you've got a transfer pump. As always, you need pump to move liquids. So we go this way, fill up the settling tank. And from there, uh, we, if it's too full, well, it would overflow into the overflow tank here. But normally, it would go to the centrifuge, as we showed previously, to centrifuge, a redundant system, or to go faster. And so, um, this um, goes through, from here you've got quick closing valves. I'll explain later what that is. So, it goes from the setting tank to another strainer. Then it's heated, and that would help uh, with um, a better uh, separation, centrifugation of the solids. Uh, and um, there it goes through the um, separator. The sludge residues go to the sludge tank. And what is um, ready, what is purified, goes this way, this way, and gets into the day tank here. 
Then you see all the quick closing valves, and from the day tag, where it, that, that fuel is, is, is ready to be used, it goes to the engines. And there is a return system. Here is a 3D view of what uh, there is um, between the, now that's, um, again, the second part of it, it's after the, the, the fuel has been purified, what we are looking at is what's happening here when it goes to the engines. So these are the day or service tanks here. And you see a ship can have multiple tanks, MGO, MDO, HFO, you may have also IFO. And so this is the engine, these are the day tanks. And what there is in between is, well, another um, a system that would allow uh, to get the, the fuel at a sufficiently high pressure and sufficient viscosity. So high pressure, they are um, feeder pumps and here booster pumps. So um, if we look at that first, we have uh, uh, valves from the day tanks here called changeover valves because again like I mentioned when you are coming from coming to port uh, from from uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the ocean um, you have to switch from HFO if the vessel uses HFO to a lighter fuel so this must be done very progressively but say we are, if we're working with HFO right now, um, the HFO goes out here, it's pumped and it goes through a system which is made of a, a much finer filter. All this actually has been existing for a long time, but right now because of these environmental issues, they are uh, trying to uh, uh, suppress as many uh, as possible uh, catalytic particles. So the fuel is as pure as it could be, never pure, but at least you remove some fine particles. So the feeder pump is, is here, um, sending that through that filter, and then it goes through a mixing tank and goes through booster pump. The booster pump are going to put the fuel on a pretty high pressure and then, um, obviously, you can't if the you, you can't send a, a, an HA four, which is almost a, a like tar, uh, straight to the, the the engines. Even though the HA four here is probably warm from previous treatment, as we saw before, so it needs to um, um, it needs to be adjusted uh, to the right viscosity. And I'm sure you know what viscosity is about. Uh, when you take some uh, some wax, for example, and uh, it can be almost solid, and uh, when you heat it up, it becomes a liquid. So it needs to be burnt, to be sent to the injection system here. It needs to be adjusted. The way to adjust viscosity is to heat up. So you've got uh, heat up the the fuel. So you've got some um, um, uh, system which is composed here of uh, uh, of heat exchangers, which are heating up the fuel and a viscosity control. So you uh, decide what viscosity you want the fuel to be and that, uh, and, and you this viscosity, it's an automatic system, is controlling the temperature. So it's a loop, PID loop, so you maintain your uh, viscosity consistent and then it, it goes to the, to the engine. Um, and there is always a, a loop, a return loop, so this goes back to the mixing tank, and so on. Um, so that's that's um, uh, what what it looks like. Um, so basically, between the day tank and the engines, you've got that amount of equipment. Um, 
I just uh, described that. Um, uh, I just described it. You had uh, suction strainers to to protect the feeder pumps, and uh, the feeder pumps uh, are there to pressurize the system. Everything is redundant. You've got two each time. Automatic filter. That filter is automatic. Ah, and I forgot the flow meter because you need to uh, measure your fuel consumption. So flow meters more and more are mass flow meters, so you have the exact amount of fuel uh, in kilograms per um, uh, in kilo uh, in kilogram per second um, that is sent to the uh, engine. So it's very precise. Um, mixing tank, yes, yeah, the mixing tank which is this one where the fuel returns um, is um, its reason is for mixing the return fuel from from the engines and mixing it with fresh fuel and also compensate for temperature and pressure changes so it gives you this fuel is always pretty stable of good quality um, and that's uh, basically it now it looks like a, a pretty important amount of equipment but it, it's most of the time now put on skids um, like this one so you've got or this one which is a much more powerful unit uh, where basically all that all this is what you see here so um, yeah you can recognize some elements you know, obviously control panels but here you got the heat exchangers and filters and and the feed pump and booster pumps all that is here and here you just connect that to the piping which uh, uh, frequently is right which, which is running under the floor so you don't see it. it's very clean installation very compact you save a lot of time as well uh, using skids um, uh, in uh, you know assembling things they are pre-tested then they are put on the vessel, it's all prepared, and just have to connect them. So you save a lot of, a lot of time during construction. Uh, that's another view of, uh, of the system. And now that, that uh, you see a settling tank, separator, service tank, and that unit here, which is basically what we've seen, but it has reached a point of, of perfection. In the old day, there was almost nothing here, maybe it was just a booster pump, basically. Uh, but now there is a whole thing here, which is allowing to uh, filter uh, fines, cat fines, catalytic fines here. Uh, for example, it goes from 60 to 10. It's, um, it's to, again, uh, face environmental requirements now. That's just for showing what eventually all this system looks like when it's on a engine room um, display. Uh, recognize the uh, main engines and the uh, DGs. Uh, here are the that's they are the fuel tanks, um, bottom double bottom bottom tanks, and uh, centrifuge. It's a very typical uh, arrangement. Things you see quite frequently on, on every ship, um, on, the, on the control uh, room and uh, in, in, uh, on the PCs. Now let's look at the high pressure side, which is after the booster pumps and after the viscosity control, which means um, when we enter the engine, So the high pressure side is the engine injection system. So it's this is on the engine, close to the engine. Um, that's where the system uh, pressurizes and inject the fuel into the combustion chamber of of the every cylinder uh, in in cylinders. So one of the main elements here, I I show I've shown an example. There are several systems will go. Uh, two systems actually and two main systems will go through that later but this is um, to show the, the main elements here you always have a high pressure pipe a fuel injection pump and injectors 
here are the injectors so this is high pressure and the main functions of uh, the injection system is to adjust the fuel quantity adjust the injection timing and atomize the, uh, the fuel in the cylinder So in order for an engine to use the fuel properly, um, you need first to send the right amount of fuel to meet the power requirements. So, and you need to be able to throttle the injection, uh, the fuel amount, and that role is played by the injection pump. So all this happens after the booster pump that we saw previously. You've got then an injection pump. And the second uh, important aspect is that the fuel must be injected at the proper time. If you inject it uh, during the, the cycle, you know, while it's... Uh, uh, if you inject it during the, uh, the uh, exhaust phase, you're obviously going to cause a mess here and the fuel is not going to uh, to burn so you need to inject it precisely at the end of the compression at a certain point so it's a very very precise work to adjust the injection timing when the injector starts opening and when they close so all this is controlled by uh, uh, the camshafts um, and by cams or by uh, an electronic system, um, EFI, electronic fuel injection system, which is opening, closing the injectors at the right amount of time based on sensor information and uh, an electronic control unit. Uh, so you've got a mechanical, a pure mechanical way and an electronic way to do that. And talking about this, um, if it's camshaft and we'll, you will see the camshaft is pushing uh, pushing a, a small cylinder of, of fuel um, you can at a certain time you can modify the position of the cam such a way it does that a little earlier a little later uh, but by the way, the, the speed of the camshaft for a two-stroke engine is the same as the engine speed. So one revolution of the camshaft is like the engine speed. And a four-stroke engine, it's half of the engine speed. Uh, the other uh, important aspect is fuel atomization. Um, it must make small, very small droplets. It must create a mist which has a cone shape, which is very specific. The design is extremely precise. So that all the fuel has a chance to vaporize and participate to the combustion process. If, you, uh, if there is unburned fuel, it's, uh, uh, well, it causes a lot of issues. Well, first you, you use more fuel than you should have. It cools down the, the cylinders. It causes particulate emission. It's, it's really something that we don't want and more and more the technology is allowing us to control that more effectively. Uh, here they, they, they are <laughs> two systems, these are jerk pump system and the common rail system. So what are we talking about here, the jerk pump system? Uh, it's it's uh, the, the traditional, most of the way, but still widely used of injection. Um, I have here, I had some animations, but uh, I see that they are not working to show what it is, so I'll try to insert them. But you can, you can see on the attached uh, PowerPoint you have, you can see those animations. Um, but what the, the jerk pump is a system consists, actually, there is one, um, one um, uh, injection pump and one injector per cylinder. So if you have uh, eight cylinders, you would have eight injection pumps and you would have eight injectors. Um, 
Uh, so um, it's the injector pump is operated. That's the injector pump here. That's the injector, injection pump and injector. So you've got here a cam. So the cam rotates, and as you see, it pushes this up and down, up and down. And there is a, a definite volume of part, uh, here. It's like a plunger, a piston. So it's uh, you got fuel in, and you got a return. But it takes it it's it uh, sucks that fuel and pushes it up with a super high pressure of three hundred bars into that um, into the the injector, and this again is for each cylinder. So the adjustment, you know, beginning and end of the of, of the uh, injection process uh, is adjusted on this cam, and you can see here. That's a, a typical engineer exercise. It's uh, the profile of the injection profile where you've got an angle here and the cam. Uh, you've got the angle. And as the cam position changes, you've got uh, this moves to, to the right or to the left. But the adjustment must be perfectly synchronized with the, um, the moment when the injection is, is needed. So. Like for example here, you know, at this angle, cam angle, you have, which corresponds to the phase of the cycle, the injector opens, it keeps on being open, it injects, and then it injects, and then it closes here. Now you can adjust the, uh, obviously for throttling or increasing power, you know, you need to send more or less fuel. Um, so this is done uh, by uh, rotating that plunger, which is here. See, there is a sort of groove, and um, so you turn it, and it's uh, it's a heli helix, and so you modify the volume of the chamber here. Of the again, this is a piston. It's like you would have a, a modifying. You would modify the uh, volume of the cylinder here. Just moving the rack, which is here mechanically. And again, the timing the, is adjusted with the, 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 the cab here. Quantity of fuel injected is adjusted with this rack. So that's basically your acceleration pedal here. You know, you want to go faster, or if you want more power, push it, pull it. So that was the uh, jerk. Now, uh, the second type, which is a more modern ejection system, is called the common rail system. I had an animation here, it doesn't show, but again, I'll try to insert it, uh, or otherwise, it's on your PowerPoint, you can see it move, uh, it's pretty nice. So. Um, one fuel pump, and this is a fuel pump, I'm showing a small engine here, but the same principle, um, generates a, a high pressure, much higher than the, the previous system, the jerk system, over 2,000 bars, and send that to this high pressure pipe. That's why it's come, called, called the common rail, because from here, you know, this is pressurized by that pump. You've got all those little pipes, um, that go to the injectors and deliver the fuel. So the common rail system is, um, you can see it here. As I was mentioning, you have a, a high pressure pump and you've got the common rail here, and in injectors, and they inject in cylinders here. You see, um, you see another another element here, which is the ECU, electronic control unit. 
So these are like solenoid valves. So the electronic control unit gets its uh, signals from uh, various um, various sensors, like uh, here camshaft. These are sensors, camshaft speed position, camshaft speed, uh, crankshaft, camshaft, accelerator, speed variation, um, temperature sensor, air temperature sensor, coolant temperature sensor, etc. All this goes to that electronic uh, control unit, computer, which um, at its turn will uh, send a signal to each one of these solenoid valve, fuel, they are also called fuel valves, injectors, and open them when required. So there are less mechanical parts involved. And, uh, like it's opening, closing, opening, closing, opening, closing, opening, closing, opening, closing. Um, so that's, that's the principle of the common rail system. So that's a pump here, um, and the um, and you can uh, the advantage of it is that there is a uniform injection pressure, although uh, there are some some issues sometimes some restrictions some effects here of pressure fluctuation, but um, so. They try to, manufacturers, designers try to get it as short as possible, but um, it's uniform compared to, to the jerk uh, pump injection system. And you have the ability to vary the engine timing while the engine is running, so you can optimize, opt optimize your, your engine operation quite well. The design is much simpler and you have a really a smokeless well most of the time it's well adjusted a smokeless operation. So this is the preferred option to uh, optimize diesel engines um, with traditional fuels uh, in terms of uh, emissions. That's uh, a view of the injection system arrangement on a, on a large uh, two stroke marine engine. You see the common rail unit is here, and we got the high pressure pipes going to the injectors. The fuel pumps are here. And you have um, sensors. We don't see them, but that's to tell you what, uh, what it looks like. Now a word about the injectors. Uh, this is animated too. Uh, and again, you can see that on your PowerPoint. But uh, injectors, this is a large engine. Um, and that's how the injectors are located. You see, they're on the side here, you've got the rail and you've got the fuel distribution. So the rail is, uh, is a double uh, pipe. It's, it's obviously you can't have leaks here, especially close to a uh, hot surface area. And personally, I had this issue several times of having um, fire due to the to leaks in this area and sometimes projections to the turbochargers. Well, it's unfortunately one of the most dangerous uh, spots in an engine room, critical spots. Now the. Um, how is it done? You have um, uh, the fuel enters here, you've got a solenoid valve, so it sends a signal, electrical signal, signal, so it moves up or down in a fraction of a, well, in a very, very brief moment, just opens up to deliver the right amount of, of fuel to the uh, cylinder. And um, so the timing, the opening, closing time of the of the needle here, the, the, the tip is open, the spray tip, and it's a cone shape here, but the opening time is controlled by the computer, the ECU, and here is a, a gut of a view of a 
what it is. So you've got the, that it's a different system than this one, but it's still the solenoid uh, system. So we, here you've got that solenoid, you've got the fuel arriving here. So depending on the whether the solenoid is activated or not, it's um, clothing the, the line here, so the fuel is not going to the tip. And so when the fuel is admitted, it goes there, lifts up the whole thing here and sprays through the nozzle. Now we're getting close to the end, but a quick word on the marine engines governors is not directly the fuel system, but it's uh, related as well. So I'm, I'm sure you're all heard about the engine governors. They are really like uh, the car cruise control. Um, it's a, an electro hydraulic remote system that is connected to the engine fuel rack. So, um, and it regulates the uh, engine RPM. So dealing with fuel rack, it was uh, that sy injection system we saw earlier. Um, here, see, that fuel rack here. And uh, a lot of it now is uh, electronic, so it, it's it's connected to the ECU to, uh, uh, you know, send more or less fuel or open more or less time the injectors. The governor, this, this is a traditional governor, uh, mechanical and uh, elect electrical, a little motor here, solar motor, and the rest of it is mechanical, hydraulic. And so the governor also prevent the uh, overspeed of the machine, so there is an overspeed setting. and. This is important when, when you know when to keep the speed constant, uh, when you know that uh, ships during storms, you know, sometimes the, uh, the, um, the propeller gets partially out, out of the water, so the torque is different, it, and it, it would tend to accelerate the, the speed if there was no speed control. Some of the uh, safety aspects, it's, as I said, these are pretty dangerous, um, or very, very critical part of the engine room. Uh, dealing with fuel and heat everywhere, electrical uh, lines and um, pipes um, that can leak, etc. So, uh, one first line of defense here are the quick closing valves, and we we'll look at that a little bit later on on on, uh, on settling and service tanks. You also have um, relief valves on uh, like that on uh, on pumps and heaters in case something goes wrong with a uh, heater heats too much and then there is a failure in the regulation system. Well, it it uh, uh, it would act. So you got um, uh, low pressure, low fuel oil pressure alarm, high high pressure. Uh, temperature, low temperature, high pressure. You've got also uh, remote uh, stops for pumps. And as I mentioned, the, uh, the all the high pressure, so it's uh, extremely high uh, pressure, uh, all those pipes are double skinned. There are even little um, devices now to detect small leaks, some sort of uh, aluminum wrap. And uh, anyway, we can talk about that later, but um, this is a very, very protected area. Now, closing, uh, quick closing valve, they are, uh, remember we talked about the date tank and so, uh, well, service tanks, etc. Um, they, these valves, well, if there is a leak, it would be in the engine room or close to, uh, it would be dangerous in um, and uh, well, we you need to also cut the the fuel supply to an engine if there is a fire. That's one of the first thing to do is cut the fuel supply, otherwise the fire could will keep on uh, going. Um, but so these are systems that um, 
and they are like globe valves, uh, or other type of valves, but the their property to shut down remotely and uh, instantly. So that's some example of uh, of those valves that you see in the engine room here. And those valves are controlled by, uh, here is our control panel, so you can uh, control them remotely. Um, you see in this control panel, you've got several levers, four here. And um, you have, um, here is one of the levers shown. It's like a little piston. It could be um, uh, pneumatic or hydraulically controlled, fail safe anyway. Um, uh, Probably not electrically controlled because you could lose power. So this um, this is a standalone, say, source of energy that you have. So the principle of that is uh, it's pretty simple. You uh, you have those levers. That's what we saw here. This is it. Yes, and you got those valves. So you uh, uh, activate the sandal. It sends. Here, if it's, it's hydraulic, so it would send the pressure here and it would trip uh, a, a small hook that would uh, allow the valve to go down. Here's a um, view. Well, it's not a very clear view, but you've got a spring and you've got that uh, hand wheel here and you've got the lever. So you've got uh, the, the pressure is sent to the piston and then it trips the lever and goes down and then you can re rearm the whole thing. Now to, to finish, uh, we're almost there. It's just, uh, I was saying earlier that uh, there is more and more international, uh, uh, more and more uh, environmental uh, pressure in terms of regulation. So in 2020, we may be, uh, with what's going on, it may be partially delayed. Uh, I don't know where we are at, but supposedly January 1st, uh, the, that was supposed to kick in. And um, so what is it talking about? Uh, the International Maritime Organization has uh, ruled that uh, emissions should be reduced um, here, this is about, you see the sulfur content, and sulfur content must be reduced um, to 0.5% from, from current 3.5%. So a lot of less sulfur is permitted on ships, and this is everywhere, not just in uh, environmentally controlled areas, it's ships uh, traveling around the world and far offshore. Um, this is about the planet. Ships have gone through the radar for a long time in terms of emissions, but that's that's it now. And the other big, big factor, SOX, um, emission, uh, emissions, um, you know, that, that's sort of orange haze you see on town, it's uh, SOX. And um, the um, this... Uh, this is also uh, the goal is to to get a seventy seven percent drop, so this is going to um, to uh, go through a considerable reduction in the you know the HFO has got a lot of sulfur, uh, which also by the way has, has a corrosive effect on equipment, but the problem here is more health. Um, so this um, this is going to be. Um, changing the quality of fuels um, and so more and more fuels like MDO and LGO are going to have low sulfur content, very ultra low sulfur content now that's uh, ULS fuels, it's already available when you sail to the US uh, from say uh, Brazil and you, before you arrive in the US you need to, if you use HFO you need to uh, switch to a uh, uh, ULS ultra low sulfur content fuel, which is quite expensive, and it's. Um, uh, but it was before because of the because you were arriving in a 
in the wars of a country that was having a very stringent emission regulation, but now it's worldwide. But there will there are even more stringent regulations when in some countries when you approach the ports. So well, so uh, the fuel is changing over time, you know, and uh, at the time of steel, steam it was it was uh, coal that was widely used. And then uh, from the 1930s to today, uh, HFO was used as a main propulsion fuel. And now um, LNG has got the favor. It's not a perfect fuel, but it's, uh, um, it's, it's uh, uh, still, um, it's much, much better in terms of particulate emission. And so this is more and more uh, what uh, companies are doing. Otherwise, they keep on using low sulfur fuel and the exhaust gas are scrubbed. This is the only pa the other parallel route here, um, a part of the uh, LNG. So this is uh, this is becoming very uh, uh, critical. There is lots of effort put on trying to find uh, fuels that are uh, clean in order to comply with uh, IMO. Um, so yeah, LNG is one of the fuels and the number one right now, and being developed. So just a quick word about uh, LNG. I, I spent a significant part of my career as well working on LNG and developing, trying to develop that as marine fuel. So, but it would be the subject of uh, another uh, another lecture, more in depth. But just you know, LNG as marine fuel. It's uh, the emissions here are are producing or well, producing. Uh, twenty five percent less c o two than conventional marine fuel, so again it's not perfect there is still c o two but it's less uh less in the air um, the exhausts are cleaned and no particulates um, but one of the issues here is that uh, lng is mostly methane, so methane is much worse than c o two in terms of greenhouse gas effect but it's only if it leaks, so there is a lot of effort to prevent uh, LNG uh, gas to leak in the atmosphere. But LNG in its form, like here you see in these LNG carriers, are two types here, membrane and sphere. The, um, it's it's uh, transported at uh, minus 260 Fahrenheit here at atmospheric pressure. And it's not that dangerous. It's not. Some of the ships that uh, you know currently are working with uh, LNG, and there are more and more. You got some cruise ships like this one, a Crowley Roro ship, um, in operation with LNG. Um, you've got uh, here uh, a container carrier supply ship from Harvey uh, offshore, and here it's, I think it's a it's a small tanker. Um, more and more uh, effort on this uh, on this aspect. Uh, many of these um, systems are dual fuel, which means they still burn some uh, some <coughs> um, some uh, traditional fuel, diesel fuel, but pure light fuel, uh, about two percent. Uh, like uh, that's why you see dual fuel engines because they well, they can burn both fuels, but also one thing, when they burn LNG, they are not burning completely LNG, they burn 2% of another fuel. So, but they are 100% fuel, 100% uh, uh, gas engines, like Bergen engines from uh, Rolls-Royce. Here is a, you know, Caterpillar uh, project showing um, uh, an arrangement with MAK, dual fuel engines here, and the LNG tank. The problem is that LNG tank take a lot of space, a lot of space. Um, and um, here is a Wartzilla uh, design. There are lots of conversions from uh, ships that uh, uh, were with conventional propulsion to LNG. And that uh, would conclude it. And thank you very much. And next one would be the uh, Blue Boy system.